Good morning, I'm Kristen Valetti and welcome to News Desk on SiliconANGLE TV for Friday, December 21st, 2012. Here's your Mobile Angle news for today. Nokia has entered into a new patent license agreement with Research in Motion. At the end of November, RIM's attempt to sue Nokia over patent issues backfired when an arbitration tribunal found RIM to be in breach of contract. As a result, this new agreement will put an end to all existing patent litigation between the companies, as well as withdrawal of pending actions in the U.S., U.K., and Canada. The financial structure of the agreement includes a one-time payment and ongoing licensing fees to be paid out from RIM to Nokia. The specific terms of the agreement are confidential. Paul Malin, Chief Intellectual Property Officer at Nokia, had this to say, We are very pleased to have resolved our patent licensing issues with RIM and reached this new agreement while maintaining Nokia's ability to protect our unique product differentiation. This agreement demonstrates Nokia's industry-leading patent portfolio and enables us to focus on further licensing opportunities in the mobile communications market. This is similar to a deal that RIM signed with Apple, which continues to pay royalties after signing a licensing agreement in March 2011. RIM appears to be taking hits from all sides lately. The company reported on Thursday that it lost a million BlackBerry owners worldwide during its last financial quarter, the first such decline in the device's history. RIM reported other bad news as well a month before introducing its new BlackBerry 10 phones to the public. Revenue fell 48% in the company's fiscal third quarter, plummeting to $2.7 billion from $5.2 billion a year earlier. The company is crossing its fingers that the BlackBerry 10 will win back customers who may have switched to Android-based phones or iPhones. RIM said 79 million customers were using BlackBerry devices. In a call with analysts, RIM CEO Thorsten Hines said, We believe the company has stabilized and will turn the corner in the next year. We're realistic about our competitors, but we know that customers in this industry demand and respond to innovation. Until now, RIM had been able to offset the sharp drop in BlackBerry's popularity in its traditional markets, especially in the U.S., through increased sales to users in developing countries. Because every BlackBerry user generates high-margin monthly fees from carriers for RIM, the last quarter's loss of subscribers is more than just a symbolic setback. In the call, Heinz indicated that RIM had been reducing those fees, which account for 36% of RIM's revenue, in an effort to keep BlackBerry's current product offerings alive. Additionally, Heinz said that the new BlackBerry 10 phones would substantially revamp how RIM would set service fees. Heinz explained that with BlackBerry 10, corporate and government users will be able to pick and choose what services they purchase from RIM, a step that he said could mean that some of them would no longer generate any user fees. The company was unclear about what fees the BlackBerry 10 would produce for consumers. HTC will be siding with Microsoft in the tablet arena against the likes of Apple and Google. According to sources familiar with the company's plans, HTC is working on a Windows-based 12-inch device and a 7-inch model that can also make phone calls. Expected to debut in the third quarter of 2013, HTC's products will be based on the Windows RT version of Microsoft's operating system running on Qualcomm chips. A 7-inch tablet would be the first of that size for Windows RT as Microsoft tries to compete with the iPad Mini, Amazon's Kindle Fire HD, and Google's Nexus 7. HTC was turned down for participation in the initial round of Windows RT devices, a process Microsoft held strict control over. Ultimately, most of the devices approved through that program weren't ready for sale when Windows RT was released in October. Toshiba's machines have also been scrapped. HTC's production details and exact schedules have yet to be finalized. Yesterday, Apple informed Judge Lucy Koh that it would appeal her decision from earlier this week not to ban sales on a number of Samsung phones. Judge Koh denied Apple's motion for a sales ban on 26 Samsung products, saying that any infringing features were just part of a larger feature set, thus making a sales ban too broad. That decision meant Samsung can continue to sell those devices, which are mainly older models in the U.S. The sales ban proposal came as a result of a jury verdict in August that found Samsung infringed on multiple Apple patents. 
Apple was awarded $1.05 billion, which is still subject to changes from Judge Koh. Apple's appeal filing comes a day after Samsung noted that one of Apple's key patents in the case was recently re-examined, with all 21 of its claims rejected by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Only one of those claims was involved in the Apple-Samsung case, and Apple has a chance to argue for its continued validity. A report from MoPub this week showed indications that iOS 6 usage spiked up, possibly as a result of the introduction of the new Google Maps. However, Chitika, an online advertising network and analytics company, also performed a study which suggested that the iPhone 5 release in China could account for the increased usage of iOS 6. Chitika's study only covered active device in in the U.S. and Canada, where it saw no spike in iOS 6 usage during the week of December 11th through the 17th. MoPub's research pulled its results from global networks, including China, where 2 million iPhone 5 units were sold in its opening weekend. The true iOS 6 usage rate will have to wait for future studies to be revealed. Japanese car maker Toyota announced today a new wireless car charger. The charger is essentially a mat located on top of the dashboard that uses a special charging standard known as Qi. According to sources, the feature will eventually become standard in all Toyota cars and is part of the car manufacturer's technology package, which will cost car buyers almost $2,000. Toyota says that wireless charging will be fitted into its Avalon model when it becomes available in the spring. Toyota's development comes as the result of an agreement between 100-plus phone brands that make up the Wireless Power Consortium, which called for an open standard for wireless power. The result of this is Qi, which allows any enabled phone to be charged using a Qi charging pad, regardless of the brand. Verizon has added 29 new markets to its LTE coverage area. Verizon's announcement comes on the heels of an AT&T announcement that it has brought its LTE network to five new cities for a total of 125 cities. Verizon is making good time in their nationwide build-out and is ahead of schedule in terms of availability. The company announced a goal earlier this year of having 400 markets in their LTE coverage zones by year's end. Verizon has achieved that goal two months ahead of schedule. And one more update for the day. After much criticism for their updated terms of service, Instagram has changed its policy once again and introduced a new filter to their app. You can find more information on the latest from Instagram in our breaking analysis segment with SiliconANGLE contributing editor John Casaretto. So be sure to check out all of today's videos on our channel. Over the holiday break, we'll be bringing you reflections from 2012's Year in Tech and providing predictions for the new year. So be sure to tune in daily to News Desk on SiliconANGLE TV. Happy holidays.